Welcome to the first episode of GDPR Now, a podcast dedicated to GDPR and all things privacy. GDPR Now is brought to you by This Is DPO. Your host this week is Mark Sherwood Edwards. That's me. In the studio today, we have James Leeton Gray of The Privacy Practice. James, welcome. Thank you. Would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Right, yeah. I've been in privacy uh, for probably about 16 years now. That makes you an old man of the privacy it, world. It does. Um, and like most of us, I sort of fell into it. I was, um, I was originally a political journalist, and then I'd moved across into policymaking and uh, was at the BBC, and was getting them ready for freedom of information and took on data protection at the same time, um, which seemed to me the more interesting of the two, uh, and I still think that's probably correct, uh, and have stayed in it ever since, and then about four years ago set up my own company. Okay. Well, it's, it's not that many people start off being a uh, BBC producer and end up being a uh, data protection specialist. You're one of the few in the world, I imagine. I, I suspect so. Some of my colleagues still can't quite understand it, but I still think that the privacy is fascinating. It's all about identity. It's about who we are. It's about our relationship with the state, with companies, with each other. Really interesting stuff. So privacy is at the core of what makes us us. Good. Okay. Well, uh, that's a pretty fundamental thing. Um, and in this, uh, this episode of GDPR Now, we, James and I discussed it. We thought, what should we talk about? And we thought, well, it's the anniversary of GDPR, more or less. So we would talk GDPR one year on. We're going to talk about governance, uh, the handover from setting up GDPR to actually running it, um, senior management engagement, staff engagement, that kind of thing. James is going to do most of the talking. I'm here to ask some, I hope, intelligent questions. Uh, one of the things, the first thing I'm going, to, I'm going to ask James, though, is what size companies are we talking about, James? Because the GDPR, will, in terms of practical application, well, if you're a 100-person company or 10-person company, that's different than if you're a huge conglomerate. So typically, what size companies are you looking at? I can honestly say that I've got a range right the way across. I have uh, companies down in the dozens of employees and also work with uh, some of the blue chips um, with thousands, indeed multiples of thousands across the globe. So I see it for right the way across that spectrum. And I think what's interesting is actually their scale of problems, yes, may be the same, but in practice, they're all the same thing. It's just what resources they have and who they can pass it on to, who they can get help from. That's what's different. But in the end, many of us in this industry, if such it is, um, we're all tackling the same things. Mm, agreed. OK, let's talk about governance then. What would you, how, typically medium-sized companies, how do they set up their governance, do you think, nowadays for data protection? And how has that changed since the advent of GDPR? I think overall what we're normally seeing is something that started off during that project phase as an independent uh, entity because people didn't know what GDPR was really going to entail. Um, you can argue they should have done because really it wasn't that different from the directive that was re uh, replaced. But this was felt to be new and therefore needed a project team to lead it. So um, uh, really what we're then seeing is, have people carried that over into BAU? Have they still got a sort of a specific committee just looking at privacy? That's less common now. What it tends to be is that people are feeding it into, say, a compliance programme, the risk programme. I think probably some of the larger and the better resourced, again, uh, companies or those who perceive this as a significant risk for them, so they are very data-led industries, are still seeing some specific governance structures. Um, committees that are offshoots, normally standing offshoots off the risk committee, sometimes actually, uh, I have one client where it is an offshoot of the board. So you are seeing a variety of patterns but what I think is universal is that DPOs are saying, well, the management haven't forgotten this, but certainly their attention is being drawn to other things. Um, and we're into a sort of, well, we've done that, haven't we, kind of mode. Um, and I think the governance structures are the key 
for people to sort of correct that or try and steer them back into a GDPR wasn't something that happened to us last year. It's something that is and will always now be. And we need to respond to it. Okay, that's interesting. And what do you think then, if you take the medium sized company, I'm not quite sure what medium is, but what would you think, what would you recommend as the, as a, the, the ideal structure for a good data, data protection regime? I think it depends on, not on the size, I would suggest, but on the data dependency. If, if you like, if, if you are a data-driven or an information-driven company, then your governance is going to have to be more proactive. And also, it probably needs to be tied in to the broader data governance structures. If you are a manufacturing um, firm who only have a small amount of data in your HR and your contract areas, then you're going to need a lighter touch governance program than if you're a startup that probably only has half as many people, but whose function relies exclusively on the continuing flow of that data. So it seems to me that, that tying it into the broader data governance function where it exists is probably the thing that makes the most sense. But sometimes that's quite difficult to do because data governance tends to have been set up um, prior to this privacy thing coming along. And again, there's a perception that privacy is there to block rather than to enable. And if you do it wrong, it can do, of course. But if you do it right, I would contend it can actually help with the data governance. But where it's just been grafted on to an existing data governance structure, I think it can um, prove difficult. What you need is some kind of integration, but then that relies upon having the maturity on the data protection side to allow it to do that. And not all companies have yet got to that state. Understood. If you were a company, which, let's say data intensive, but you didn't really have a particularly sophisticated data governance function, well, actually, let me rephrase that. One of the things I've seen in those kind of situations is people setting up a data protection executive committee, like an exco for data protection. Mm. And in those, you invite everybody who you think is going to be required. So you've got people from the InfoSec world, from data governance, if that's separate. You've got compliance in there. Maybe have HR because they have a concern. Um, and you got someone from the uh, purchasing department because they're, they're in theory running the the vendors who you might have outsourced some of the data protection function to, and that and that that group then meets monthly. He's got a set agenda and goes through all the issues and so on. Do you think that's a workable approach for for most companies? I think it's possible. I think I've set up structures like that. I think there has to be an a genuine understanding and a buy-in from all of those people that it's going to be worth their while turning up once a month. So in a sense, we're back to how data that is the individual company, what are the kind of issues. Do you need a core of those people who meet monthly and then others are brought on? I also think, I mean, we're back into culture. This is about culture. It's about the attitude to risk. If you need, and I think privacy often does, buy-in, then you probably need all those people on board. Whether the governance structure is the mechanism for getting that buy-in, I doubt. What it is is a mechanism for ensuring that the buy-in has occurred, but that's not the same thing. And it does seem to me that, that when you have a meeting which is sitting in everybody's diaries, if you don't have something that each person can either contribute or learn from on that agenda, then it's going to die in the medium term. So I don't think uh, there is a one size fits all. I like structures where the operations team are seen as as fundamental to the privacy decisions as the compliance or the legal team. I think that's absolutely spot on. But there needs to be something for them to be doing rather than for them just to be talked down to, as it were, by the privacy people. Yeah, yeah, understood. OK, well, if it's a... OK, assuming you get moral stroke emotional buy-in, 
assuming the privacy people aren't talking down, then at least they would give people a basis on which to move forward. I think it's very useful. I also think the other people who need to be in there, um, and it's one group, as it were, we didn't mention, that's finance. Because in the end, they need to understand why resource is going to be needed in this area. And frequently, finance aren't always sort of in thought of and invited to some of these. And I think it's quite key. With one large company, I actually persuaded the chief finance officer to become the chair of the equivalent of the group that you've just described. And once I'd won him over to the idea that he should be doing it, firstly, everybody else turned up because you don't want to um, get the wrong side of the CFO. But also, he could genuinely see and had the issues and the potential balances and all of the risks put in front of him. And at that point, I think you got a level of buy-in that hadn't occurred before. OK, that's interesting. And actually, and that's quite a smart political move to get finance involved. And what about DPOs? I mean, DPO, we'll talk to, we talked about this a bit earlier before we started this podcast, but... DPO is one of those funny terms. It's a bit like the term director in the UK. You can be a board director, you can be other kind of director, no board responsibility. How, in your, in your experience, the companies you've been dealing with, how are they, have they appointed DPOs? What do they understand the DPO to be? Do you mind expanding a bit on that? Sure. Well, you're straight away into, is this a mandatory role? So you're into the, um, the large-scale monitoring, um, you know, public sector immediately, fine. Um, large-scale monitoring, processing on a large scale of sensitive personal data. Are you caught by any of those categories? Interestingly, some, some quite large service sector um, companies I've encountered have gone, well, we're not sure we're really caught here. I would be surprised if that is correct, but they have taken that decision. So you're seeing a, a variety. Um, the Article 29 Working Party have come out with their um, opinion, also allowing for the possibility of voluntarily creating a DPO. The only thing is they implied, uh, or they said, that the voluntary DPO would pick up all of the legal obligations uh, on the controller or the processor and on the DPO implied by the mandatory DPO. So if you don't think you qualify for a mandatory DPO, I'm not quite sure why you would volunteer to create the role and inherit all of those responsibilities. But whether you do or don't, I've sort of said to clients, uh, interestingly, I'm still occasionally getting, have we made the right decision calls about, you know, appointment or not of a DPO. And I'm saying, well, I think it's a secondary question. The primary question is, have you got a good data protection compliance structure in place? And is there somebody holding the ring on that compliance program? Because if there is, then de facto you've got a DPO. You can call them a data protection officer. You can call them a data protection manager. And there are legal ramifications from that decision. But the fundamental thing is, have you got the structure in place to support compliance? Have you got the structure in place to get accountability right? Have you got the structure in place to ensure that the subject's rights are fulfilled, et cetera, et cetera? Because that's the fundamental. And if you haven't got that right, then frankly, worrying about whether you've got somebody with the title DPO or not is a very secondary concern. Once you've got that, then yes, fine tune whether you have a DPO or a DPM. I have a client who is a manufacturing client who at the moment, and I think it's right, does not qualify for a mandatory DPO. But within a comparatively short frame uh, of time, you know, within two to three years, they almost undoubtedly will because the nature of their manufacturing is changing and the nature of the data they're collecting through what they manufacture is changing. So what they've decided to do is say, OK, we're going to set this up for the first year. We'll do it as a DPM. And then we are going to voluntarily move across into the DPO territory because we don't know at what moment precisely we would be caught legally. And we don't want to sort of, as it were, do it too late. So, yes, it's an important question whether you're caught by the mandatory DPO or not. It's clearly important because, you know, you'll be in breach of the regulation if you should have done and you didn't. Yeah. 
But ultimately, far more fundamental is, have you got your processes in place that whoever that individual is can then run? Okay, that raises some interesting points. The, let, let me ask you a few questions then. The, the way I've always visualised it, let's say you're not, you're not in a, the mandatory GDPR, down mandatory DPO position, right? You're just an ordinary company. I mean, you have to laugh to, well, to an extent that the, the best the GDPR could do in telling you whether you need a, a mandatory DPO or not was to say large scale. You know, very helpful. Thank you. Um, but leaving that point aside... The mandatory DPO is by nature uh, independent, right? Yeah. By definition. Therefore, unlike everybody else in the company, they're not part of the executive team. The executive team gets told, <clears throat> but, well, the CPO get, gets told by the board, CEO tells everybody else, and that's all works all the way around. If you're part of the executive doing data protection, then you take your orders and so on and so forth. If you are a, a DPO, a mandatory DPO, then, of course, you don't take instructions from anybody. You are, by definition, independent. You've stopped being part of the executive. And the kind of the way I have visualized it is that if you're an ordinary company or a large company getting bigger and bigger, at some point you'll trip into the mandatory uh, DPO frame. At that point, you need someone, either a new person, to come and take on that new independent role, or probably your head of, uh, of data protection at that point needs to kind of leave their previous role, put on the DPO hat, um, and and st- then effectively become independent within the company, arguably, mm. right? So I think that's kind of slightly awkward, and I don't think that that. So I'm I've, I I see and and the GDPR and the uh, working party data protection boards clarifications aren't always that helpful. Um, I see the DPO as being a more like a non-executive director. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's one part. Then I also note what you said, that the Working Party's paper on DPO suggests that if you take on the title of DPO on a voluntary basis, then you inherit all the legal responsibilities of a mandatory DPO. I have some uh, scepticism about that because, well, it's not in, you know, we, li- we live in the rule of law. It's not, it, it's not in the GDPR, which is a law. The Working Party Stroke Data Protection Board is a persuasive interpreter of the law, uh, but they're not an inventor, they're not a law of the mm. law, and they're not a lawmaker. So that's something they could have put in the uh, GDPR had they managed to persuade anyone to accept that as a provision. Clearly they tried, it failed, but for some reason it's still in their, their consultancy paper. So I've, that, that conf- and I think, I think uh, talking particularly about the UK now, I think there seems to be a big confusion between this term DPO, is this DPO the head of data protection in the business or is it someone who is, like as provided in GDPR, whether you're mandatory or whether you're voluntary, independent? And that that doesn't seem to have, I don't see that distinction being made very clearly, but maybe you disagree. Well, I think I've seen some companies, I think the larger companies, you are seeing perhaps a CPO still being in role and there being a DPO separately. I think it, this idea of independence, absolute independence, it's a bit like absolute impartiality. It's quite difficult to sort of work out what that means. I mean, people are being, in, in smaller companies, they're saying, well, we, we haven't got a full-time role here, so therefore it's got to be combined with somebody else. Maybe we'll put it with IT. Well, except IT is going to probably have different priorities in terms of funding. And as ever... Information security is not the same, same thing as data protection, Good. et cetera, et cetera. So where the putative DPO sits, I think, will clearly have an influence upon their ability to demonstrate that independence and, um, uh, and, and provide the service that the company requires. But you're also, I think... It's not the only contradiction. You've also got the issue of expertise. Mm. We are told the DPO has to be an expert in this. And those of us who've been banging around for far too long in this industry used to moan like mad about the fact that there weren't enough people in it and saying you're going to need more. And now uh, I'm hearing people saying, well, I don't like all these new people arriving. They don't really know very much. Well, where are we going to get these people from? We've got to start somewhere and we've got to start with a base and we've got to start helping people learn this stuff. But it is going to be difficult initially to say, 
Wambo, on Monday, George is taking over as independent data protection officer. They are now an expert. Well, they're not going to be an expert on Monday. So you've got the independence issue, particularly, I think, felt inside small and medium enterprises, um, combined with the expertise issue, because these are sometimes quite tricky calls on points of law interpretation of the EDPB or the ICO guidance, not all of which is necessarily absolutely aligned. And so you've, you've got to sort of try and create a compromise, it seems to me. And that compromise is going to be the least independently clashed, give somebody the best opportunities to try and get up uh, and get some training. I mean, in, our continental colleagues have got a more mature external DPO market. That's something that the UK hasn't really got. There are companies now mm. offering DPO services, but most of them are also in their infancy. So the degree to which you can be absolutely certain of those services is, is or finding the right one to match to your company, your expectations and your budget is actually going to be quite difficult. So I think we'll struggle through this at first. But I think Stage one is is ensuring that every company realises they need one. I'm still encountering companies who, frankly, I think would fall into the mandatory category who haven't appointed a DPO. Yeah, and I'm not sure, and I know exactly what you mean, and on that one, I'm not sure if that's what's worth that or the ones that just say, oh, some poor guy picked, or woman picks up the job on top. There's one I was talking to the CEO the other day who's part of a large UK-based large marketing, I won't give too much detail, network. And I said, um, well, how many personal records do you reckon you hold? And he's poured mm, about a billion, which I thought was interesting. And uh, Probably qualifies under the large scale. Under large scale. And uh, that, his, uh, that company's DPO is just this person who's doing another job and has now got DPO as well, which I thought was a bit... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bit of a shocker, but there you go. Um, enough on that. Um, let's talk a bit about, do you think for most people, the transition from the kind of let's G- get GDP up and running to the BAU, has that worked? Has that things got kind of lost? I think the, um, I, I would say that, that most people have just about finished their programmes. <laughs> I don't think I've got many where I'm still seeing G- GDPR implementation program still running. Uh, I'm getting some calls from people coming and saying, well, can you come and kick the tires on what we've now got um, to make sure that it does? We think it meets the criteria, but do you think it does? So yes, I think we're into BAU. And I think the experience of those DPOs, DPMs, those people who've got responsibility for this is um, where I would focus. Because some are saying, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I'm got the resource that I asked for. Um, They're the lucky ones, obviously. Um, And I'm now finding it sort of slightly harder to get engagement with operations teams and so on. But on the whole, they know they've got to do it. Um, I think there are probably more who are saying, I'm slightly worried that management have now sort of moved on to the next big thing, Mm. that I'm not getting into the CEO's office when I want to. I'm not... You know, it's not that they're not taking my calls, as it were, but there's a certain element of, well, we've done GDPR. That was last year's thing. Talking to um, uh, um, a partner in one of the senior law firms quite recently and saying something similar, that he thinks that there is a sort of reaction that, well, we've finished GDPR without sort of realising GDPR is still all around you. It's in the air. It's, it's everything we do. And there was a sense that they've signed off on that and somehow think that that's it, it's gone. Whereas, as we know, BAU in this process is going to be much, much more difficult to achieve because of that accountability um, uh, principle, because of the need for the business to be supplying information on a continuing basis to be able to demonstrate compliance. Not that we were compliant in May 2018, but that we are compliant now in May 2019, and here's April 2019's figures to show that. And I think that's where people are probably beginning to feel the pinch. They're having to push 
the boulder uphill, to mix my metaphors, that that their, the enthusiasm, if it was there at all, has waned a little bit outside of the privacy team, and they still need that engagement. And some businesses, I think, do understand that, mm. but I think there are quite a few who are going, uh, hang on, haven't we done that? Yeah. Um, uh, and and a bit like, you know, sort of the tourists who had one photo of the Trevi Fountain have now done Rome. Yeah. You know, Rome is eternal city. GDPR is the <laughs> eternal um, piece of regulation. Uh, understood. There's, uh, that, that brings, I mean, I think the count, you mentioned the accountability principle. That's, that's very, in, you know, that's a very thing to, useful thing to bring up. And it's quite, that's, that's kind of amusing. It's slightly unusual in terms of legal obligations. Normally you just have to comply, and that only ever arises after the event that something's gone wrong. Did you, were you, were you at fault? Were you not at fault? That's a dis- discussion here, normally. Here you've got to show pr- uh, preemptively that actually, uh, you're doing everything like you should be doing, that you do have good uh, pra- good contracts in place with your uh, suppliers, that you're man- monitoring them actively, that you're auditing them periodically and so on. Structurally, and this comes a bit back to the governance thing mm. we talked about earlier, how would you recommend that people, you can't be account, you can't be preemptively accountable after the fact, right, by definition. How would you recommend that businesses, organisations structure themselves that if someone turns up or the ICO turns up on Monday, then on Tuesday, you've got everything in place. You can show them, yep, yeah, accountable, here it is. Well, I mean, there, there, there are various software vendors who are offering this as a sort of one-stop shop. Some of them are better than others, um, in my experience, but clearly that's a route. There is a technology route around this, but not not every company uh, should go down that route, and it's not appropriate for every company. So, I mean, the records are processing. Let's just go to that. I, I don't think that is the full extent of um, the accountability principle. Some people say, well, what, if you've done your records of processing, you're finished. I don't personally buy that. But it's a pretty good starting point. It's a pretty core um, um, requirement. So how can you do that? Well, you could, you've probably done um, a data inventory program when you were doing your GDPR. Who's responsible for updating it? Have you gone for a devolved responsibility? Um, is there a records management system in place? A bit like information security is separate from um, data protection. Records management is separate from, but you need them all to be tied together and actually working together. The records management, you've got to be getting those um, uh, records of processing, um, those ropers. You've got to be making sure that the retention schedule works for your kind of company. The size, the level of granularity of that retention schedule, whether the technology works with it, whether your staff actually know it exists. And so you're back to records management, which was always a Cinderella service uh, Mm. in the vast majority of companies I've encountered. And I Cinderella, think, except they never get to go to the ball. Well, they, they, yeah, they're, they're, yes, they're still stuck without their glass slippers. I think you're right. So, I mean, they, they, they never got the resource. They never got the management backing. It, it's sort of not really very sexy, sexy records management. I think it's absolutely core, mm. but it's not sexy. And so you ended up in a situation in which now um, the records management function probably could be your greatest ally stroke complete the people to support stroke even do the records of processing activities but they may not be involved um if you did a data inventory was there a process to keep it updated are you going to devolve that is it going to go down to each division you're going to go down to each department you know what level of granularity is that devolution occurred is it going to be a centrally run system if it's an IT-based system, how are you going to ensure that when new IT functions arrive and are bolted on, that they're also caught? So again, I mean, you know, one size doesn't fit all. It will vary. But I think that if you don't intellectually know where you would start for the creation of a records of processing activities, uh, if the ICO called then you have fallen at the first hurdle. You know, you've then got to do the data subject rights, you've got to do your data breaches, you've got to do uh, training and awareness and all the other things that I think you need under accountability. But if you can't even get over that first hurdle, you can't run the rest of the race. 
Understood. You mentioned the technology at the beginning, and I always, and I don't, you know, clearly technology can be very, very helpful. I always slightly worry that people will use it, will think I've got technology, I'm sorted. Right. I think the initial analysis has got to be technology agnostic. You know, what does my business look like? What are the, my, you know, every business is at least slightly different from me, or every other business. What are the issues in my business have that are different to others? How am I going to cater for those? And once, only once you've done the, that kind of analysis, can you then plug in the best bit of technology and know which bits it's not going to cover, which you've got to hand crank somewhere else. Absolutely. And also, perhaps more for me, more fundamentally, is how long have you allowed for the implementation phase? Mm. I think there have been a number of companies I've seen where they have bought in software, not allowed to the fact that it's going to cost them more in the short term, firstly, to get it up and running and implement it, make sure that it runs properly before you do away with your manual-based system that you had before, assuming you had a manual-based system, and then get it integrated into your business as usual. So it is, it is never a silver bullet. It can be the right solution for um, some companies, particularly the larger scale companies where, you know, the, purely sort of things like staff turnover means that you're identifying and sending out emails to people to do things or the people have left and nobody knows and nobody in that department is going to pick up that email, etc., etc. So automation has a place, but automation is not the be-all and end-all. And automation can mean a diary uh, entry in the DPO's Outlook calendar. You know, It doesn't have to be an all-senior dancing piece of kit. If you've got one, great. Or if you're going to buy one, great. But in the end, you're, you're absolutely spot on. The analysis has got to be there in the first place. The knowledge of what data you have and where it is. You're, you're back to the fundamentals. Do you know where your data is? Because if you don't, then you know, the technology may not be able to help you. Okay, that's interesting. Retention. Well, staff... D- d- it's, well, I was going to come on to retention schedules, but for, before we do that, staff engagement, senior management engagement, we've talked a bit about senior management. Do you think, and you, what about the staff generally? Do you think they are sufficiently engaged nowadays? I mean, <clears throat> there is a certain amount of GDPR fatigue kicking around, certainly at senior management level. I can't, I've always thought that ordinary Joe, Joe, Jane employee would actually be a bit more sensitive about it on the basis that actually we all data subjects and no one wants other people abusing our data. So we kind of, we have more skin in the game in that sense. I think it's easier than it used to be in that it is rare that a day goes by without a story in the papers about identity theft, about breaches, about... Um, Facebook or Google or whoever being slammed by some privacy group or another for, for another of their wrongs. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the concepts around privacy, the fact that it is important to people is constantly being brought into the public's uh, sort of focus, if you like, that, that they need to be aware of it. So I think you're right. I think in that sense, it's easier to remind people that they have responsibilities, that there are things that, as an employee of this company, you need to be doing this or this. I think their individual reaction to that will be as varied as as people's reactions to any other area of controversy. It doesn't automatically mean that people will get it, but sometimes you find you've tapped into a particular privacy um, I'm going to say fanatic, and that's probably, it sounds pejorative, but I have encountered people who were really, really keen on this because they see the significance from their own lives. Mm-hmm. Where well, you can tap into that, I think it's brilliant because you've got natural enthusiasm. But you're still going to have to have somebody, you know, Georgina in accounts is going to have to be the DP rep because she's been told by her boss she's the DP rep and she couldn't give a flying about it. Yeah. And, you know, that's the way of the world. The same is going to be true of any other compliance function. I think probably because there was so much coverage last year and there were so many people and companies trying to race across the line. And to be fair, uh, Elizabeth Downham, the ICO and Many of us were saying this is not the finishing line, this is the starting line, but it still sure as hell felt like the finishing line for a large number of people. 
And so I think generating that enthusiasm, making sure that people realise that this is significant, will be harder going forward. But I still think it's feasible. I think you need to be inventive. I think people sometimes, we, we have really, really sort of strong marketing departments who are coming up or, or relationship with a marketing company that come up with all sorts of whizzy ways of selling our products, selling our services. And we don't do the same thing with our own staff around some of these fundamentals of compliance. And, and I think when you do, you get into a different way of working. You know, are you really trying to sort of get people to remember exactly how many um, data protection principles there are in the GDPR in your annual training program. If you do, personally, I think you're getting it wrong. What you're wanting to get across is the significance of this as data to the company and to the individuals, not seeing it as a piece of law that you have to have learned, but as a reaction, a set of antennae that you should develop to make sure that you are supporting your company and making sure that that data is used correctly and looked after. Good point. Actually, interesting that you reminds me the best piece of internal comms I saw was about running up the GDPR was about trust. And the main message was people trust us to look after their data properly. It's a trust thing, right? And we, all we have to do is deliver on that trust. And the GDPR is just a formalised statement of delivering on that trust effectively. And that's a fairly simple message that people can communicate quite simply and people buy into you'd have thought and you mentioned compliance just there and and sure enough data protection started off as a, as a compliance kind of activity and I'm kind of wondering also but I mean and that's kind of in you know, a version 1.0 say I'm wondering what the future would look like because there's, there's at least two as- aspects to it one is uh, the ethical aspect I mean and this has come back to the trust thing again whereas you know we're all data subjects in our private lives so we all know how we want data about us to be handled. What, that's one element of it. And the other part of it, of course, is data becoming increasingly valuable. You can make money out of it if you handle it intelligently, get the right permissions at the right times and all that kind of stuff. Are you seeing any of your businesses shifting from the compliance to it's not really just a, it's not a technical compliance issue. It's a moral state trust issue on the one hand and then maybe it's a step further or maybe it's a slightly different step thing and actually this is a great business opportunity data is valuable for us smart about how we how we handle it i think there are different reactions i think we're beginning to see the value exchange i would see that second category as a value exchange my data is worthwhile therefore what are you going to give me in exchange for my data now Facebook and Google would argue, well, we're giving you these brilliant services um, in exchange for your data. I think others will start saying, well, actually, I've got more value than that. Um, A luxury car maker uh, uh, in Europe has started getting worried about their target clients going dark on them. In other words, they will begin to realise that their value, uh, the value of their data, because their data is worth more as high net worth individuals, that they will learn about personal data stores sooner and the marketing opportunities will start disappearing. So that company is looking at how it can change the relationship with its present and future customers and try and actually add value through the relationship. So, for example, in Germany, each uh, land, each uh, sort of region has a date on which uh, winter tyres have to be worn. Um, And... This apparently varies regionally and people sometimes get caught on the hop because they've forgotten that it's about to come up in their area. And then at the far end, it's not illegal to not be using winter tyres, but you're using up a load of fuel that you don't need to use up if you're into the spring. And so what they're doing is actually changing the nature of their marketing. They're saying, right, we're going to base this around what they want, well, what they want is being reminded of servicing opportunities, being reminded of winter tyres, of the dates. Can we get this sorted for you in advance? Making their life of their customers easier by using that data. Because they think otherwise, they may be in a situation in which they've got this brilliant product that they see it in terms of these cars, but they can't get them to half the people they want to sell them to because they're using personal data stores and their, their appearance on the web has disappeared, if you see what I mean. 
So I think the value exchange thing is going to get more acute as more players come in um, and start saying, well, if you give me your data, I will give you this in exchange. So I think we're going to sort of see an auction, if you like, in the medium term. On the ethical front, I think it's true. I think there's people are beginning to realise that data has value, data needs to be treated in a particular way, and I think there will be, again, a differentiation in the marketplace between some companies who will carry on saying, well, basically, if it's out there, I'm going to use it, and if you don't like that, well, that's tough, you shouldn't have put it out there, through to the... Uh, other, if you like, extreme of saying, well, we will always consider this data yours. You can do whatever you like with it, even though it's sitting, residing on our servers. Mm. And I think, you know, those aren't mutually exclusive. Um, and I think smart companies will be manoeuvring their way through this. And it will depend on the clientele. There are going to be some companies who will rely on that trust you were referring to. There are others who are far more ephemeral uh, far more ephemeral in their data subjects' lives and who will not be as concerned because it's not as much of a risk to them or potentially to the data subjects. You know, They may not care as much. They may be a group where they're perfectly happy to give up privacy for pizza vouchers or whatever. So I, th- I think this isn't going to be a sort of single direction for us as an industry. And there will be some who just want to get over the line, get compliant and finish. And there will be others who see this possibility that I think is really interesting, of tying this into data governance and actually saying we can start doing something better with this data. Interesting. There's a, I think we're going to have to wrap up very shortly. We're trying to keep these to about 30 minutes and we're hitting that now. If the Tim Berners-Lee uh, credit of mentioning the World Wide Web, he's got a company, so I can't remember, I'll put it on the show notes, who intends to keep the data store separate. So you can, you know, your personal yeah. data store separate from the usages you make of the data. So you get more control of it. Mm. And there's a recent uh, paper from a UK government body. They're hiding a American economist called I think Furman, James Furman, doing an analysis of the digital economy. And part of that analysis was looking at people like Google, who've got a huge amount of consumer data, a huge amount of market power, mm. and what they could do to re- maybe to address that. And maybe, again, back to the idea of separate, the, the person, the data stores, the use of the data stores being, being, being separated out. Um, and I'll put a, uh, a reference to that uh, in the show notes, and maybe it'll be subject of a, uh, of a subsequent podcast. Um, but I think that brings us to uh, the end of our time. So thanks to all our listeners for listening. We hope you find that useful. Uh, thanks so much to James for agreeing to take part. Thanks J- for having so, me. Not at all. The James uh, and your business, the Privacy Practice, how, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Um, if they go to the website. So it's um, privacypractice.co.uk and there's a contact me and contact us on uh, on that. Good. Okay. Well, if you missed if you didn't uh, note it down it will be on the show notes you can pick it up there future episodes of uh, GDPR now are going to cover a number of things we've got security issues and planning for breach coming up Uh, we're going to have a dedicated episode on insurance for data breach cyber insurance how you what you can buy what does it look like how much does it cost GDPR for the from the SME perspective Um, if they're a bit more detailed purely if you're an SME what you're looking at programmatic advertising um, that is in case you don't know what it is it's all those ads that pop up as you're surfing the web um, that's a, about to become a big issue i think in gdpr and we've got the french uh, CNIL really uh, laying into various companies mm-hmm. about that uk's ico had a, a workshop about it recently um, i'm expecting that to really develop for them in the next year or so um, we'll, another one we could revisit the whole issue of cookie consent when the e-privacy uh, director comes out if it ever comes out and we actually some reviews of privacy technology that would be a useful thing that people have been asking for um, also covering breaking news stories and listener questions if you've got any particular questions or like issues uh, you'd like to talk about please send them in to uh, info at this is dpo.co.uk that will be on the show notes as well and if you actually want to appear on this show, uh, let us know, and uh, I'm sure we'll be happy to have you. I'm going to leave you with a, I think a riddle isn't quite the right word, but here it is anyway. 
In what circumstances is a photo of a living person not personal data? And I'll repeat that. Uh, in what circumstances is a photo of a living person not personal data? Anyway, that brings us to the end of the first episode. It's thanks from me and it's thanks from James. And hopefully see you next time. Thank you.